What's up, Sec DSM? It's been a while. Last time I think I presented was at the Forge. A long time ago. So it's been a while. I'll talk about that. I did a two and a half year vacation from InfoSec doing product management. Super interesting. So I want to talk about that and tell a couple stories. So if you're cool with that, I think we should get going here. And yes, it is my 10th wedding anniversary. So when I'm done, I like you guys, but I got a bolt because my wife <laughs> is waiting for me to get home. So thanks for having me. And, and why am I doing this? It's inspired by a new gig. I'm on day four of a new gig, which is awesome. I shifted from uh, fintech into healthcare, which is a lot of fun. Some old friends. Brandon was bugging me on Signal, and a couple other things happened, which was cool. And then I saw a presentation um, from Locomocosec, which is in Hawaii, called Productizing Security for Leverage and Scale. And I'm like, that's interesting. I just did this product management thing for a while. Maybe we can think about security differently. And so that's what I'm going to do at the end is kind of give you my summary of where I think security and product management do have a nexus. So from that deck, just to kind of say, like, why would you talk about that? This is exactly from the deck. So I parroted this slide almost 100%. Are we building solutions, secure solutions that determine applicability? They're easy, easy to consume and adopt. Do we give users security as the easy choice, easy path? Like YubiKeys, like they're awesome. Who wants to do TOTP anymore? Make security the easy path. Do you have a value proposition, et cetera? So I, I looked at these principles, I'm like, sweet. I think there's a talk here. So I'm gonna give my own talk, but I will link and share the slides and all that stuff to that presentation from Locomocosec, which is really good and detailed. So for agenda today, I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna try simple slides and some detailed stories. I'm gonna tell two of them. One is back to the future. Because now that I'm in healthcare, I'm super scared about running NMAP. And I'll tell you why. Um, and then I'll talk about kind of my career hopping around and why I think it was a good thing. And then I'll summarize that at the end. All right, so let's talk about back to the future. And I mean 2004, 2005. Um, so has anyone here had a network scan go awry? Yeah, yeah, and me, and me too. So this is an old one, but I think it's a good example. So I had a great intern. Really great intern. He is a pen tester at TrustedSec now. The guy's amazing. And if he's, he's not watching, but he was part of this story. So this is in telecommunications, and we wanted to make sure we could eradicate Telnet. TCP 23, no one does that anymore. A um, Couple questions, though. Anyone know what UDP 69 is? What protocol is that? TFTP. Come on, you guys have updated old Cisco boxes and stuff. Okay, so this is old school, TCP 23. And that's not me showing my elite hack source skills with Kali, I just found that on the internet. But we were scanning for TCP 23 and also um, SNMP, back when those were cool protocols. All right, so well, how are we doing it? Um, we used Perl and Nmap. This is before the Nmap scripting engine. I'm dating myself. So we straight up wrote a wrapper that would shell out and call nmap as a binary, take the output, and in Perl you can do backticks and shift the output into an array and then parse it and do more stuff. It's super janky, it's one step better than a shell script, but it's definitely terrible. So we're doing that, and so this intern, I won't say his first name is running it, he's doing a good job. And I said, pick some friendly targets, buddy. And he was doing a half open, the sin stealth scan dash ss, so he's running those, and I'm like, all right, we're RFC 1918. He's keeping it real. It was 17217, and he was sticking about one or two um, added addresses in the third octet, like just like going above, you know, like slash 24 per floor kind of thing. I thought we're safe. And he's running it, and he has a bug, control C, and he does something. And he's running it, and we're not checking it into subversion or anything. He's just, just hacking but it's a TCP half open scan, no big deal. And so he's cranking on it for a good day or so and lots of edit, fix, fire again and again and again. So you know where this is going, right? A few days later, I got the call and I thought we were careful. We just changed that third octet a little bit. No big deal, we're just scanning one port. I thought the network topology be more like Top Gun Maverick, which was awesome, right? Like at the end when they go to bomb that nasty nuclear thing they're doing, right? Hills and barriers. I thought we'd have a topology that would have segmentation. We had the topology of Florida. It was flat as a board. And 
I kid you not, there were lucent stingers on the other end of what he was scanning. These are ancient lucent boxes that function as a DSLAM. Digital subscriber access line multiplexer. About 42 DSL lines per card. All right, so these are out in the field, right? What I didn't know is these are so fragile, you do a half open scan on Telnet, it locks up. It'll still run, but you cannot administer it. We called Lucent, they're like, sorry, you have to reseat the card. And I'm like, oh my God. So you know, I took the heat for it, because I'm accountable. And so I had to talk to the director of you know, the national network and apologize. And we went out and had to straight up roll trucks, truck roll and telecom is bad reseat the cards, dial tone was interrupted, I take that really serious, and it was in Michigan and Indiana at like six or seven sites. So I think about this story a lot. And so what did I learn from this? Be really careful with scanning. I'm sure it's a lot better and more robust now, but maybe not, maybe the internet of things or internet of shit is, is still fragile, I don't know. I'm a little less worried, but I am concerned about destination IPs. And I guess I'll pick a better algorithm to scan some friendlies, and I think the coolest part is this guy's a badass pen tester now at TrustedSec, um, as is another former intern of mine, so that makes me happy. And so that's another little inspiration for today, because I'm getting back into healthcare. So I want to talk about story number two. So what, what happened here? So I've been doing InfoSec for about 20 years. And in 2019, I had an opportunity to get into product management at the same company. So I, didn't, I actually didn't know what it was. I thought it was project management with like fancy frills and like backlogs and like MVPs and oh, customers. So what the hell is product management? I've learned a lot. So I think this is a good way of looking at it. How is it different? Because I think all of us manage projects. That's what we do. We manage projects or contribute to projects. So here's the difference. I think it's an easy way uh, to look at this. One is a product manager has to see all product development up to the release. And that means with stakeholders, product marketing, sales, uh, sales enablement stuff. What's the pricing strategy? Like, there's a lot of overall needs. And the focus is on the strategy to release that product and iterate in the product to meet some measure. And the difference is outputs are what we typically do. We release software, we make bug fixes, we install tools. Outcomes are how you move the needle for the business. That's a big difference. I thought it was shipping software to make the customer happy. That's the easy part. You have to ship software that drives outcomes that delights customers. And you gotta use data and do market analysis. So it is very much different than project management. It's like project management on steroids. A good product manager is a great project manager, but maybe not vice versa. And I would say I'm a mediocre product manager. I learned a lot. So that's a difference. I wanted to level set there. So a little more, if you want to know more about product management, there's two people I'll kind of point out. One is Marty Kagan. Uh, he's bald like me. Um, and he wrote a couple of books and he's the head of Silicon Valley Product Group. They're called Inspired and Empowered. Really good books. They have given me lots of insight into how to bring things to market and how to win over stakeholders. Inspired is how to be a product manager. Empowered is how to be a product leader. And that thing came out after a year and a half almost two years in product. I wish I would have read that one first. And lots of good blog posts in Silicon Valley Product Group. And then a guy named Jeff Patton who delivered some training. Um, he met everyone that signed the Agile Manifesto. And his big thing is user story mapping. How do you map a solution with a backbone and figure out what a release could be? A couple more things on product management and then we'll get into the meat of this. Uh, and these are just definitions. Um, the one I like is that middle one, the CEO of the product or the directing mind. That's what a product manager is. Um, and at the end, you discover and deliver. You discover a product that's usable, valuable, and feasible. So enough on product management theory. How the hell did I go from InfoSec into product management? Well, I got a call on the weekend from the CEO. And I'm like, hey, what's going on, Ben? And he and I had a discussion because we had some turnover. And there was an opportunity to lead product, at least on an interim basis. And I'm like, what the hell? I'll do it. And I had a real strong person leading security. If you guys know Ben Blakely, the guy's amazing. So security's in good hands. I'm like, what the hell, I'll do this. Throw my hat in the ring. And I really like winning. So I've done hairy cross-functional business initiatives, like stuff on SAP. Um, how different is it? And I wanted to pull a product over the finish line. Um, it was a 
push to card, push to debit product, little PCI on top. I wanted to finish that. And I read this blog post from Marty Kagan that said, listen, if you want to do product management and you're doing it as like a VP of product, you and the CEO better have an interesting relationship because one E is the visionary and one E is the executor. If you're both visionaries, you're screwed. Both executors, you're screwed. And in this case, I'm an executor. Felt right. So I did it. Jumped and did it. You need competencies. You need team development. And I learned that this was all going to be during COVID, during a pandemic, right? You need product vision. Sweet. I got a boss that's really good at that. Sees around corners. Execution, I can do that. Culture, we can build a culture, build on a good one. Experience, I'll figure this shit out. And then do you need chemistry? Well, I get along really well with the head of tech. No problem there. Really well with the CEO. I love my colleagues. We can do this. So I pivoted. I handed off InfoSec and went 100% product, but not right away. First of all, I did product and InfoSec together for six, seven months. I wouldn't do that again. Minimum viable product versus security controls. Like, we'll talk about this conflict, so I would just do product again. I would hand off security first and foremost. Um, you need mentors. I got really good mentors. The CEO of a company called Mix Halo was one of them, named John Vars. He's amazing. And you need new skills. Like, anyone here built a roadmap? They're hard, right? It sucks. And if you show it upwards, it becomes a contract. Um, and the, the further out you get, the fuzzier it is. Um, agile for real. I always thought I knew what it meant. Little pointing, some sprints, a couple epics to organize them, stand-ups. It's a total mindset shift. Um, I had to hire product managers, scrum masters, UX teams. And then there were some changes, some leadership changes. That visionary changed. And so now I'm stuck doing some vision and some execution. That's really hard. Talking to customers and learning about stuff I've never heard of before. So I'm going to get to the nexus. I'm going to connect security and product management here soon. But let me tell you where there's conflict. Minimum viable, I already said this one, minimum viable product, what is the smallest thing you can deliver to value to the customer versus where's multi-factor? Fail fast versus fail closed, right? We want things to fail closed. A firewall does not fail open. But in product, you might want to fail fast. Friction. In product management, you generally want to remove all friction or at least define something called the happy path. Ever heard of the happy path? That's if everything goes right and the customer gets value in the first try. Okay, well in security, we add friction. Sometimes a little too much, but if you're doing bad shit, we're gonna add friction. You're gonna slow off down. We're gonna throw a capture, right? All these things. Um, voice of the customer, a product manager's job is to be the voice of the customer. They obsess about the customer. Our job is to be trusted advisors to the business. At least that's what I think it is in security. Discovery is this opaque term in product management, which isn't just doing research. It's talking to customers. It's testing ideas. It's looking at the market, competitive. It's this really hard process and structured process of analyzing what should be built and then testing that hypothesis. Whereas in security, we do a lot of analysis. Um, not as much discovery, maybe. And then delivery through others. This one, I sucked at this one. Um, we were rolling, what was it? A new API, and it had new permissions. We wanted to touch each, touch, test each permission atomically. And like it had to, it had to ship. And I'm like, screw it, let's go. So I sat down and wrote some terrible Python with Ryan. He's not here. It was bad. He fixed it. But it worked to do, to do a testing harness. I should have influenced and helped others to write that instead of just do it, right? Um, here's another thing, and I'm guilty of this all my career, and I'm sure some of you have this too. Who jumps to solutions versus defining the problem first? I'm totally guilty of that. So I kind of got my ass kicked for that one. You've got to define the problem first, then start talking solutions. And last, when you talk to customers, it's super valuable, super interesting. Looking into the soul of a customer you learn a lot versus talking with auditors, regulators, or friends like you. We think a certain way, a customer thinks another way. So these are all things that blew my mind and gave me like a rash. So I'm going to get to things that I think make us better. So these are things I pulled out of what I learned, and then at the end I'll summarize them. So these are things that I think we can use to become better as security professionals. So the first one's roadmaps. They're hard. 
so I would recommend a couple things. One, you gotta get themes. If you have themes to your roadmap, it sells. If my theme is border protection, people are gonna know what that is versus DMARC and Cloudflare. Like, no, you want border protection. That's a theme, right? Or another theme is availability. Okay, under that, you can have redundancy and HA and failover. So themes. And then when you show a roadmap, you put draft on the top of it. I'm telling you, put draft on the top of every roadmap until you christen it. And the roadmap is not a contract. Inevitably, leaders say it's a contract. Well, you committed to that. And on any roadmap, no matter where you are, you're going to have what's called a high integrity commitment. But maybe like one of them. The other ones, you're going to learn. If you're doing agile, you're going to have issues, headwinds. You're going to small test, fail fast. So make sure to communicate the roadmap's not a contract. Because if it is, it's really tough. And that, that was a hard one to learn. Um, and your backlog should back up your roadmap. Next one. Use your company goals, right? Every one of us works for some company that has a goal or mission. Connect that with the work you're doing and your backlogs to pick what goes in that roadmap. You, so I mentioned themes, right? Now you connect what you're gonna work on with your company goals and your backlogs. You get better alignment. Uh, people may not accuse you of chasing the new shiny thing if you connect what you do to your goals. All right, the other thing, product. I didn't talk about UX, but user experience or product design is part of product. I kind of didn't know what this was. So I'm being vulnerable here. I'm like, okay, what does UX do? Are you like graphic designers and steroids? Like what does UX do? And UX really helps with discovery, interview customers, help with A-B testing. Yeah, they're really good at graphics and mock-ups and high and low fidelity design, but I had to learn a lot from UX and UX taught me something amazing. So there's an interesting cheat code for all of you. When you're delivering a portal or a dashboard or a solution, you should know the top 10 problems your customer is gonna solve in that solution when you deliver it. Because what happens when you log into something you wanna solve a problem? So think about that, when you deliver something, even if it's a security solution, what are the top 10 things you need that to solve for you and are you delivering that? So it's a UX trick. And I think security has a lot to learn from user experience. Oh, there we go, I already cheated. Top problems to solve when presenting something like a dashboard. I will give a good example of UX in a second. Uh, and this one is when you have a security decision, give good feedback to the users so they know what the hell they're doing. Ah, problem statements. So I love these things. It took me a while to get resonating with problem statements. They should be really clear. They should stand by themselves. The other thing is diagrams. I learned when you bring a customer a diagram of what you're doing and where the hot spots are, you instantly like become a consultant and they will trust you. So I love bringing diagrams, even if they're simple. Even if they're really simple, like Kevin McAllister's drawing of this tonight, like here's where the bar is, like bring a diagram. Whoever made that, by the way, it looks exactly like Kevin McAllister's Home Alone map. So kudos. All right, check this one out. Um, I'm gonna get a little nerdy with payments, but, but, but it's fun, I think we gotta talk about this. I think security needs UX love. Here's an example. In the US, we move money really slow. The fastest way you move money typically is on card networks, right? Swipe a card, it happens. Settlement's really complex and behind the scenes, but you clear in your real time. So the clearinghouse has something called real-time payments, RTP. It's real-time account-to-account payments between banks that participate in the clearinghouse's RTP network. You're like, all right, Ben, what does that mean? It straight up means I can send Nate Subra a million dollars in about a second from my account to his account as a credit push. It's a good funds model. That's actually live in the US. It's taken a while to adopt. My point is, it's just a push, right? Just disbursements. So who here eats burritos and does Chipotle? Don't lie. I know you all do it, okay. Panchero. Panchero's is bland. And it's a gimmick that they stir your contents together, and it's a gimmick that they make your tortilla in front of you. But, but, but have at it if you like it. So, all right, so you're buying a burrito. Apple Pay works really well, right? Apple Pay nailed the user experience. You buy your stuff, it goes in the cart, you click buy, you double click. At the end of the day, the merchant knows you're buying from them. You authorize the payment by double clicking. Apple Pay makes it happen. But Apple Pay works with cards, right? Does Apple Pay link your bank account? The answer is no. 
Request for payment. RFP is what that is, is what's coming around the corner. Here's why no one uses it. It's got a shitty UX. It's effing terrible. So if I want to send money real time to Nate, like I said, here's what I got to do. I got to find a bank that supports it. There's only about 10 that do it. City, JP. I got to log in to my bank in a banking app. Who loves their banking apps? I hate my banking app, right? It sucks. Log in my banking app. I got to find a federated directory to find Nate Subra. If I'm at PNC and he's at JP, good luck. Let's say I find Nate Subra and I trust it's Nate Subra. I go ahead and send a request for payment. Hey, Nate, I want you to send me money. I send the specialized message in XML, seriously, behind the scenes. It goes to his bank. The bank sends it to his banking app. He's got like 60 seconds to log into his banking app to approve it, and then it fires the money back to me. It's like the worst. This, and this is largely due to risk, right? Like, we have to know the identity, and we have to make sure the volume is low enough. We have to make sure we have strong authentication. It has to be done in the banking app. Like, this, this is purely a UX problem. Like, you guys know this. We know how to do tokenization. We know how to do freaking blinded proofs and package of pre-approved tokens. There's all kinds of stuff, cryptography we can throw at this problem. It's a UX problem. So I think security and UX, there's a lot we can learn there. And the company that cracks this code is going to make a lot of money. Okay. Happy path. We should reward good behavior. If someone comes in, and I don't know, I'm going to make this up. They come in, and there's mutual TLS auth, which is beautiful. We love them, right? And they're coming in, and they're not using a VPN, a shitty one. And we've seen them before, and we have a browser fingerprint, and blah, blah, blah. Like, we should treat them like they're gold. We shouldn't be prompting them with crap. We shouldn't be timing out the session quickly. Like, we should give them a happy path to get value. But if I'm coming in with a user agent of Craptastabot from a VPN, like we should give them a d different experience. And do you guys remember when Cloudflare got a lot of shit for giving bad experience on VPNs? They fixed the UX by making blinded proofs, tokens, and you install a little um, uh, browser extension. You get a pack of those that would blind you, but say you're not a douchebag. So you should reward good behavior and apply friction selectively. Don't apply friction to everybody. Like, everyone gets 24 character passwords and they cycle every 30 days because you had one issue. Like, that's bad. Don't do that. MFA the stuff. So anyways, happy paths. Um, you guys may or may not do this, but A-B testing, small experiments, what works, what doesn't, and then launching features dark, turning them on for select subsets of your users using feature flags. This is good stuff that product does all the time. This is an interesting one. So if you're working with your boss or you're working with the business and you're asking for money, right? We have budgets and you want to bring a security solution to the business. Here's a couple things that'll sell. One is, is if they're replacing another security solution, if the costs in that out or there's a, a savings or at least you're decreasing additional spend, like you should go after that, like show the value of the product because you're supplanting and simplifying the environment. The other is everything you release or install should have a go to market strategy. What the hell does that mean? What is the success metrics of the security solution? I don't know. And my security skills are a little old. They're getting, I got dusting them off. But if you are installing, here's a good example. Let's say you're rolling out Duo security, which I adore, by the way. Um, here's a benefit. You should talk about this benefit. How many people call the help desk when they get a new cell phone on the weekend because they need to get a new You've lived this, Stephen. They need to get a new um, seed and TOTP set back up. You give them a hardware token or a push notification for an app they can install themselves, less help, de de less help desk calls. Or straight up, you're tapping a YubiKey. You can auth probably 400 times faster than getting your phone out, getting TOTP. That delights the user. You should get credit for that, the usage. The, the, so when you're launching or building something, have success metrics. The other thing is, this is just documentation, but good documentation. If you're releasing a solution, have a brief or a poster explaining the what and the why. What are we doing and why are we doing it? That stuff sells up, down, and across your organization. Stakeholders. Um, 
this is tough. In product, you have stakeholders all over the org. You've got finance that wants reports. Why aren't those part of the delivery? You've got a risk and compliance team asking for new controls and thresholds. Uh, you've got people lobbing tickets in left and right that are just piling on backlogs. Um, you have the revenue team saying, I want to sell this. Where is my sales enablement tools? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and everyone's busy. So how do you wrangle all those stakeholders? How do you hold them accountable? How do you drive transparency? Tools, process, and making sure your product managers are really good with your stakeholders. So in security, I'm working with stakeholders all the time. So think of, if you guys ever do like investigative support, HR is your stakeholder. Build that relationship. What does shared success look like? How are their things coming and prioritized? So I think about stakeholders a lot. Ah, and this one, I never cracked this one. We started getting better at it, but transparency. Everyone should see what all the stuff is you're working on. Not investigations, they shouldn't see your, where your crypto material is stored, but what are all the priorities, the prioritization of them at a high level, and don't have to stack rank, but know what's important, where your backlogs are, you should trim those backlogs. I'm really bad at that, we got better at that. Um, and this leads to trade-offs. Someone wants you to do something, there's a trade-off. Straight up, you can say, listen, you want that? Great, I'm gonna go ahead and pull a ticket of the same size out of the sprint. That's how it works. That takes a backbone that's really hard to do. Or if someone wants to jump priority, and that can happen because the business changes, that's a trade-off. Something else isn't gonna get done. Exposing those early and often is hard. I'm not good at that. And influence over direct ownership. Most people in product don't have a big team. They work indirectly with engineers or others to deliver solutions. And in security, I've got a really small team. I'm okay with that because I will work through sysadmins, people running virtualization and endpoints because they're my stakeholders. And we're going to get stuff done together because you have shared goals and I'm transparent. So I didn't need direct ownership and I don't think you always do in security. All right, here's another thing I learned. Stop in the geek speak. I love talking about HSMs and entropy and authenticated encryption with associated data and blah, blah. At the end of the day, other than maybe us, like the business doesn't understand that. They want to know that we're going to use more simple and modern encryption for data in transit based on TLS 1.3. Don't worry about what that is. Just know it's simple and use the leading practices. And oh, by the way, it's been out for about two years and it's going to have a compliance benefit because it's really hard to man in the middle. So that brings me to my summary. First of all, anyone know where that is, that uh, picture? Listen to my accent, and that's a clue. I'll say the word sorry. Does that help you? Where is that picture taken? Door County, Wisconsin. So if you're in Wisconsin, it looks like a mitten, right? Up here at the tip. Uh, is this road, and at the very end you take a ferry to Washington Island. That road was designed that way to make us kind of take this path through nature and enjoy it by a Danish guy. So I've been on that road many times, and so that is a big metaphor for my career here. So this is it. This is my story. I don't regret doing product one bit. I learned so much from it. I'm really grateful for those experiences. To have the opportunity to go and do something totally new but yet not turn security totally off. Um, I never felt comfortable, I'll be a little vulnerable here, I never felt comfortable running product management. Um, but I don't think change is comfortable, but I can tell you it made me better and I learned a lot. And I, I said this, I never turned my security brain off and I really realized that's my passion. So I did a bunch of volunteering on the side to keep some skills fresh. Uh, Kinley's one, that's a neobank that's starting up, it's a lot of fun. Um, I had a couple calls with Kickstarter, and then um, the place I'm working at now, I helped them a little bit, which is kind of fun. So volunteering kept my skills fresh, and I recommend you guys volunteer and give back. I'm really excited to be back at SecDSM, and I started listening to the security podcasts again. So instead of listening to the Glen, Glenbrook Payments on Fire, which is fine, I got the Darknet Diaries out and Risky Business, and it was just like it was smooth. It was like jazz. felt good. And so I'll end with this. Not all career paths are linear. Mine's not. It bounced all over the place. Um, but I've got some new foundation, new skills, and I think it's a lot of fun. So I'm bringing those to InfoSec. Hopefully it makes me a little better at it. And if you have an opportunity to do something a little different, go for it. I'm glad I did.
That's it. We doing a break? Sure. Or I'll take questions. Yeah, fire them away. Let's talk about it. So, yeah, I'll repeat it. So, really good question. I'm going to give you an answer you wouldn't expect. Um, the, the question was, hey, you talked about MVP. That's an acronym that I don't really like because it means we're never going to go back and do what we need to do because we're rushing something. All right. I actually tried to abolish it. I'm like, we're not using it anymore. So I went to some training with Jeff Patton. He's like, don't use it. Unless you own the definition, don't use it. So one of the contemporary definition is the smallest bit of some solution you can offer value to understand if it fits your intended need. An MVP can be a mock-up inside a keynote. It doesn't have to be software. So I think we're hung up like it's a little piece of shit that we're going to try, and I'll, it, it, it goes on. So one is I think it needs to be owned or defined, but here's the deal. Leadership uses it whether you don't or not. They start calling it out. Oh, it's an MVP, it's an MVP. So I would say owning it is one. The second is I started using it, and some, some of my old colleagues here remember, like I put POC in there or alpha. So I tried using different words to express something. But I guess the way I would balance that half doneness or like is it cheating is guardrails versus gates. Like, okay, great, you want to do an MVP, what are the guardrails installed? You're not touching prod, you're just, do oh, you're using trusted auth providers, you're not changing the authentication scheme, it's time-based. What are the guardrails so that you can still do it? But I didn't crack the code. People still use it all the time, and they will put more into an MVP that should be there. So I would say, define it. I tried abolishing, it didn't work. Guardrails, and it doesn't have to be software, it can be straight up a demo and keynote to a customer to prove out an idea. I don't know, it's the best I can do, man. It's a good question. What's that? Yeah. Okay. Hit me up. I just got on Discord with a new... Hit me up. I'm happy to talk anytime. I got to go run to an anniversary. Later.